So hi everyone, welcome to Act Defense. Uh, I'm Matar, uh, VP Data and AI here. And before we get started, uh, we really have an amazing lineup of speakers for you. They need absolutely no introduction. You all know why you're here. Uh, so let me take just a few minutes to tell you what is Act Defense, what we do, why we do it, and uh, why I think it's so important. So all of us live most of our lives or a big part of our lives online. We have very rich online lives. Right? We interact with communities, we have friends, uh, and we spend a lot of time there. Now, the thing is, is that our online lives have a direct effect also on our offline lives. The online world has a direct effect on the offline world. And that's why at Act Defense, we believe that by protecting the integrity of every online interaction, we will lead to a safer place, a safer world, both online and offline. That's what drives us, that's why I'm here, and that's why I do what I do. And what does this mean in practice? So in the past year, we reported 45 million child abuse content items to platforms, for, to online platforms, for them to go ahead and remove. Every day, we discover, we detect two th almost, almost 2,000 new links to terror content, which we then report to these online platforms so they can go ahead and remove it. In the months leading up to the 2020 election, there were one billion Yes, that's billion with a B, one billion fake news items viewed. Now, we all remember January 6th, and we saw in real time as it was happening, the severe consequences on, of offline consequences, real world consequences of this online consumption of fake information, of fake news. So there's clear offline effects for our online lives. And so, this is why at Act Defense we really we aim and we strive to keep the online world safe. And what do we do? Is how do we mitigate the risk of, of online harm? So first, there's we have a variety of different abuse areas that we cover. Uh, I talked about terror and uh, child abuse and misinformation. There's also hate speech and fraud uh, and profanity and human exploitation and so forth. Now, what we've seen is that the, really the only way to be able to keep online platforms safe is with technology. And so let me just quickly define what it means to have sort of this abuse life cycle, right? What does it mean? Uh, so assuming that first there's sort of some new threat that's detected, some new abuse, for example, uh, some new fraud or, or something, a new, a new abuse, right? First, we have to define it. Right? We have to understand what it is. We have to kind of craft, someone has to craft a policy around it to sort of say, okay, what is harmful and what isn't? And what's sort of on the gray boundary, okay? So that's the first thing that needs to happen then we can start detecting it, right? You can start detecting this new threat because you, you already know what's harmful and what is it, so this abuse can now be detected. And then this abuse, this, this content that is detected needs to go to moderators. These moderators need to be trained in order to be able to enforce, right, and remove this content. And only after that whole life cycle has happened can we say that the threat has been contained. Now, in order to really do this in a way that both is at scale, right, we want to detect at scale, we want to be able to catch all of the harmful content, and also in a way that safeguards moderator well-being, right? So they're not exposed to more than they need to, and so that they're not flooded, and it's all manual labor. The only way to do that is by introducing technology. And that's where our RND at Act Defense comes in. We work very strongly on detection at scale, okay, for the variety of abuse areas that we discuss. Now, I don't know how many of you guys saw recently uh, the leaked document about the lack of a moat around these proprietary large language models. Did anyone see that? Anyone know what I'm talking about? Yes? For those, who, okay, so for those of you who haven't, it's a great quick read. And there's sort of two big takeaways here. Um, the first is that because of uh, cheap and rapid fine tuning and the cumulative effects of fine tuning, the open source community and open source large language models are going to overtake proprietary large language models. And that's crazy, and it's the power of the community. and and sort of this new technology, and you know, every day something has come out, we go to sleep, we wake up in the morning, there's something new. And the next big point was that data quality scales faster than data size. And now what this means is that by the, these really uh, brand new sort of open source LLMs, they get much, much better results by working on highly curated, high quality data sets. The quality of the data matters, and it matters a lot if you're looking at the new things that are coming out. And that's actually, going to be our transition to Shimon's talk, and this is a big focus of Shimon's talk. Shimon is going to be talking about data-centric AI and the value of data and how to leverage data the right way sort of in your models to get maximum effect.
Hey, uh, my name is Shimon. I am a team lead at ActiveFence uh, Data Analysis Team. And today I'm going to talk about data-centric AI or more specifically about how we at ActiveFence adopt the idea behind data-centric uh, AI during our uh, model development uh, uh, pipeline. So here is my very, very talented team member, which is here. Uh, and uh, during our fun day in Vadinisnas in Haifa and uh, everything that I'm going to present today related to their uh, great effort. Um, so to give you some sense about uh, how we got here that the data is more important and uh, more, we can get more benefit from the data, I'll give you some, some motivation uh, about the uh, last 10 years. So, in the last 10 years, there, uh, there were a uh, kind of a craze of modelitis, an obsession of tweaking uh, architectures by ensemble few concepts and stacking uh, different architectures in order to achieve state-of-the-art results on a specific data, so, uh, data sets or a specific domains. Uh, but yet, most of those architectures did not scale well in uh, production, uh, and uh, many of those are not generalized, generalized uh, well on in the wild data. They are not. They were not robust enough, so we don't know whether they are good or not. So in parallel, but a bit later, from 2018, uh, BERT was released, the first language model that was trained on uh, a huge amount of data with an unsupervised manner. Uh, with 340 million parameters, which, which uh, in those days it looked like huge model, but uh, we have we from then we had an explosion of language model, uh, and we see uh, this uh, now with uh, uh, if if we thought that BERT is a huge model now it looks tiny uh, in compared to to Llama, uh, ChatGPT. And, uh, and Palm by Google with 440 million, a billion parameters. Um, that uh, with, with this, this huge amount, huge amount of uh, pre-trained language model, uh, we are not using or trying to create new architectures from, from scratch, but to fine tune them for our, <coughs> for our uh, downstream tasks. And for that, the, the, the focus has shifted uh, uh, from working on the architectures to work on the data itself, because we don't need with a, 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 with such accurate language model to create uh, a architecture by ourselves. And since the, since the focus has shifted, many platforms came out uh, to, that provide you to train a model end to end without touching anything in the architecture on the definition of the layers but to give, uh, to provide your data and your label data uh, and to achieve a pretty decent result. Uh, hugging face is in the middle, uh, most of you are familiar with. Uh, uh, they uh, released the, the, the Python library called Transformers, uh, which is uh, the, the standard today to train language models. And with a few lines of code, you can choose uh, your pre-trained language model or the foundational model um, and, uh, and, and get quite decent results very easily for any downstream task uh, with your label data. So the data scientist should or can work uh, on his data to achieve best-in-class results. So, uh, after the introduction, uh, I will uh, show you today our model training life cycle here in ActiveFence. And uh, I'll show you how we are taking the data-centric AI into practice. And the use case for the model training life cycle will be a detection of hate speech in text. And in order to get some sense about how, um, how uh, hate speech content in text looks like in the real world, a user-generated uh, content uh, platform. Here you can see some examples. Uh, at the top, you can see uh, uh, a description of a, a, a channel that contains a very offensive slur against a trans, uh, transgender people. 
Uh, at the right, you can see uh, a user profile with a description that I hate Jews, which is quite a simple example of hate speech. And in the bottom, it's a bit more sophisticated examples with using uh, emojis and lit speech in order to overcome the content moderation models. So the first thing to do uh, in every uh, model training lifecycle at the start is to collect uh, domain data uh, to, 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 to label. So the most trivial one is the first one, to, uh, the first thing we are doing is to collect open source data sets and for eight speech, it's quite easy to collect hundreds uh, of thousands of examples, quite easy from different sources and different languages. Uh, so we are good with the eight speech bar. But for some other esoteric uh, threats like child abuse, sexually explicit content, uh, suicidal thoughts, and many others, there are not a huge amount of, of data outside. So we are uh, going to our to our sources of data, uh, one is the internal and the external. The internal, since we have a, a large department of uh, of researchers and analysts that working on a content uh, on user generated platform uh, every day, we are storing all many of those uh, of this data in our internal databases. Uh, in uh, avoid the uh, threats and violation, and we can collect relevant data to our uh, use case. Uh, the next uh, uh, thing is always with the help of our um, uh, researchers is uh, uh, a database of, of, of sources, it means that we can scrape data from uh, maintainable, ma maintain that the data set that with uh, sources to, for example, uh, links to internal, uh, to instant messaging groups that we can scrape uh, 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 white supremacist, uh, white supremacist group that we can scrape data from, or uh, or a forum that glorified the Nazism and we can scrape relevant data from there, or many other websites that we are not familiar with in our day to day, uh, 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 in our day to day but they are existing, they are many, and there are many uh, kind of uh, violative websites outside that we are scraping data from. So once we collected a sufficient amount or as much data as we can, we are moving to the data labeling, uh, one of the CZPIC and the most important things in our, uh, in our model development uh, life cycle. And first, before we are starting to labeling, we, are, we need to defined our task very clearly uh, or our policy very clearly and for our use case today the hate speech i took uh, the the research definition of hate speech uh, and it says um, any disrespectful for a person or a group on the basis of uh, some characteristic and you can see it that uh, many characteristics such race ethnicity gender etc uh, considered as hate speech and it looks like very, um, very easy, and we are understand what considered as hate speech. But our labelers does not understand what considered as hate speech, and even us. There are many, many edge cases that need to be uh, covered and we need to uh, define very in very details. So you take a look. You can take a look at those examples and uh, let me know what do you think about those. Are those considered as hate speech? So even though those examples are uh, contains very offensive slurs ag against uh, minority groups, it does not consider the day speech because in our policy, uh, in, in the definition that I uh, showed in the previous slide, because they are not offensive to other person. Uh, it's not show any disrespectful for other person. And yet uh, I uh, know some other platform that such content should be moderated because it's using, even though the context is, uh, is uh, not offensive, uh, uh, they does not permit to use uh, offensive slurs against minority groups. So it depends on your policy, but yet uh, you should define it uh, uh, very clearly in order to get your most accurate uh, labels later on. So once we define our policy, 
Uh, and in order to ensure our label quality, uh, we have two main things that I would recommend to do. We have experience with, good experience with crowdsourcing as well as our internal labelers is to work in very, very small batches uh, and to review a subset of each batch by one subject matter expert in order to, uh, to, to keep your uh, labeling quality and uh, the consistency of your labels. And to detect any misalignment of, uh, between you and your labelers sooner than later. So uh, the next two things related to the labelers, uh, we uh, always um, define a control set, a set of simple, very simple, Very simple examples that um, that uh, it's quite equivalent to I'm not a robot to check whether the other side, the labeler, is really labeling the data or just clicking randomly on the results in order to finish this, these tasks. Uh, and then on per labeler, uh, you just each labeler, labeler separately against the tester? No, this one is just to control if our labeler is really work on the data. It's very simple examples. And if it fails on some, more than some threshold, we are uh, banned. The, not the human labor, I mean the algorithm. No, it's not related to the algorithm. We are talking, it's a human, yeah. Just like in service, sometimes you add a question, uh, what is the capital of the, the UK? Yeah. So to make sure that someone is not. Yeah, someone is not wrote a script that uh, randomly selected no, the, 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 the. Sometimes you get tired and just, just leave. Yeah, exactly. Excuse yeah. So you mentioned the policy in the beginning, and I totally understand there is like the legal part, but there is some, the analytical part, which is intersection. So how do you with intersection? Suppose you have some like, intersection of three sets. Do you consider that? Oh, by the way, that's like that counts, you know, the mm -hmm. multiplier effect because you know. You what what, what do you mean by the inter intersection so between policies? Speech? Yeah, so what I mean is speech, which, for example, is offense against gender and race and... Like yeah, that. yeah, we should so, cover them all, yeah. But, but I mean, how you treat that could be like huge sort of, uh, you know, huge, huge impact. Because it's, hey, the fact that I have all these things going together, it actually means that this is like the real knowledge. Whereas, so in practice, is that... that like really important on sort of um, if I understood correctly, you are talking about uh, more than one uh, yeah. such minority group that contains in the text, which means like it's more offensive than using well, only analytically. It can be it becomes like a sort of a self validation, right? So well, yeah. If you know the guy seems here and here and here, well, yeah. We, we can take it uh, under our, uh, uh, to affect uh, the decision of those. Uh, uh, I'm asking because in, for example, anti-money laundering, that's kind of what you're looking for, right? Yeah. You kind of give up on saying, hey, there is one thing which will work about. Yeah. So well, yeah. This and this and this. Uh, we can talk about it later and I'll give you the answer. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I understood clearly what so is the, 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 the... What I'm saying is instead of in practical terms, I know at least one domain area, anti-money laundering, where the intersection of multiple layers is hugely important. So the cases where there are several things going on are much, 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 much more valuable than just one thing. And yeah. it can build, you end up building your whole model thinking about this case as primary. Mm -hmm. Right? So, so you get, you might get to some kind of sort of an overview. So, um, we will take it later yeah. and we will talk about it. I have to continue. And if you have other questions, let's, let's make it uh, afterwards in the end. Okay? I remember you. Uh, thank you. So, uh, the next thing to do is take only the majority labels, uh, and for us, we are trying to uh, uh, to train any re every record with five different labelers and take the majority above five labelers agreement uh, in order to ensure the, the quality of our data. So, 
Once we, call, once we label the sufficient amount of data and sufficient amount, um, we are not starting with label all the data that we collected. So uh, as a rule of thumb, we are starting with like 10,000 uh, examples to in the first cycle in order to uh, go to the model training. And, uh, uh, and, and later on, we will back to, uh, to label the, the, the other data or part of the other data and we will reach them. But after we got some, uh, at least 10,000 uh, examples uh, that labeled, we are going to the model training. And for that, we, we need to ask ourselves a few questions. First one, what we are trying to do, we are trying to detect a, a hate speech in text, which is binary classification, if whether the input text is considered as hate speech, yes or no. Of course, the, the, the standard is to fine tune a pre-trained model, uh, but we need to select because we have many, a, a huge amount of, uh, of uh, pre-trained uh, 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 models available in Hugging Face. Uh, so uh, first of all, we need to check whether we need a mono or multilingual pre-trained model. And By the way, this example shows exactly what I was talking about. You see, there are those and there is the area. Right? Mm -hmm. So this is exactly what Okay, is. so in the text, not outside the many yes, other. Yes, that's what I mean. There is internal validation in this data. Yeah. So if you miss one, there is a second one. And the fact that there are two makes... Yeah. More but in language model, we are catching the context and not only uh, uh, specific uh, keywords, let's but say. That's the point. Yeah. You want, you want to, 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 to build the, the, the sort of scenes. Yeah. Which the transformer catches this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yes, we uh, do fine tuning uh, a, a pre-trained language model, which most of them are transformers. Um, and for that, after we uh, uh, filtered our uh, relevant candidates for, for our task, uh, uh, things that many data scientists did not con uh, take into their consideration is the vocabulary. And the vocabulary is the, the way to map the uh, the, the text into the, 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 the model. So, for example, I took the, the BERT uh, base uh, tokenizer, which tokenized the, the input text into uh, the vocabulary. And, uh, and for this uh, uh, example that we seen in the previous slides, uh, it's the name of a band with, I, uh, with kill that and nose represent the Jews. Uh, and the emoji of a nose represent the Jews, but the, the, the birth base uh, tokenizer does not recognize any uh, emojis in his vocabulary, and then we will get these tokens. So the relevant tokens here is kill the uh, related to, uh, or uh, con uh, contains in the, in the bird vocabulary, but the emoji does not uh, map in the vocabulary, hence we will get the unknown token. And then uh, our labelers will label this example as hate speech, but then in our, uh, after we will train with such tokenizer, we will get all of the existences of kill V, we'll get high score, and we should, uh, and we should know it before we are starting. And another thing, uh, I, 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 I won't deep dive how a tokenizer works, but uh, when they uh, when an, a word that is out of the vocabulary, uh, every tokenizer acts differently, but it separates the the word into pieces. Uh, and uh, I I would recommend to take your domain and uh, and extract from your domain a relevant term like minority groups uh, in hate speech and uh, offensive slur ag against minority groups and check whether they are uh, in the vocabulary of your pre-trained model or not. It will help your model to converge uh, much faster uh, than if, you, if it would uh, uh, split it because it's out of vocabulary. So, okay, after we selected our best fit checkpoint to fine tune on, we are going, we are taking out from our data set the evaluation and the test set and we are starting to uh, fine-tune our language model and after a few epochs because it's only 10,000 example we our model probably will converge 
and we will get a pretty decent uh, F1 precision and recall metrics. And we will think that our model is ready for production, but of course it's not the true because our model train on the uh, uh, the, day, the data distribution of our transit. So it's good on the data that it was trained on or the type of the data that it was trained on, and, but it can go to production. And for that, in order to make sure that our model is robust or will work properly in the, in the wild data, uh, because our customers are, uh, has different data types. So for that, we defined four more test sets. And the first one and the most important one, and the one that it's, it's hardest to define is the functional tests. Is a test that intended to detect weak spots in our policy. And, um, and a, a, a startup and a researchers uh, that we acquired uh, this year called Rewire, uh, defined for hate speech uh, their uh, functional test for their policy of what considered as hate speech. It's like 29 uh, edge cases of what can be or not be uh, a hate speech in text. And I'm talking about text, but it's relevant for, uh, for vision and for any other task as well. And as we can see here, there are three different uh, functionalities using slurs, while the, the one at the top uh, considers uh, using slurs considered as hate speech, while the two at the bottom, even though it's using uh, slurs, uh, it's not considered a hate speech, and it will help us later on to detect weak spots in our trained model. So the next test set is the data types test, is combined of different data, uh, data types. For example, reviews, chat, posts, and forum, all of them characterized by different length of text, different language, and we should know if our model is robust for, for, for each of the data types in order to be robust on in-the-wild data. Um, the next one is the go-no-go -no -go test. Uh, it's a set of examples that should never be misclassified. And in other words, it's example that if we will misclassify them, we will embarrass ourselves. For example, I hate Jews or I hate any uh, minority groups. It's the first thing that our customer will check. Uh, uh, and we, we, we always should uh, uh, classify them properly. And in the negative side, we saw we experienced with uh, some initial rounds on our uh, hate speech model development, we saw that uh, not sentences, but only input texts like Jews or other minority groups got high score. And that's because most of the existences of the word Jews were in the positive class, unfortunately. How about the uh, I hate this book or Eta Malek? Uh, it depends on your policy if those, if those groups is no, under our policy. This book doesn't exist, and, and I hate them, it can be kind of an expression that I hate evil. But uh, it, if you don't understand the text, you might think that it's kind of minority, but this minority never. Yeah. Never, yeah. yeah. And for that, we need data to cover such examples, but we need first to decide whether it's considered as hateful or not, or under the, the policy of hate speech. Uh, uh, but if the model won't uh, see such, most of the time it will get a, a low score. But in order to, to cover those uh, minority groups, we need to define such in our functional test, in functionalities, which, for example, this functionality considered as minority groups functionality. And we will uh, create examples of all functionalities. That, uh, that. You can take another example. I hate that, I hate that people. Yeah. Of course, we will see a, a exact example like that later on. I will show you. Um, the uh, oh, okay, for the go-no-go -no -go test, we are trying to achieve almost perfect result for the negative and the positive class in order to be sure that our model is robust. The next test set is the false positive rate test. And for that, we are taking uh, a data that is out of the domain that we are trying to, to detect. For us, it's hate speech. And for example, in hate speech, we will take 
uh, wall books and predict our current version against those books. We uh, assume that in Harry Potter there is no uh, hate speech sentences, so we predict. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Uh, Are muggles considered? Uh, well, you, you could even argue like you, you might argue that the Bible is something that you won't want to be a hate speech because if you classify the Bible as a hate speech, you're anti-religious. But if, you, if anyone read the Bible, it has lots of things which are. Uh, uh, we are not classifying all the Bible as ones. We are we are uh, extracting different sentences and we are no, classifying each of them. If, but if you classify a sentence from the Bible as hate speech, mm -hmm. it might offend some people. But there are some. It's for internal usage. We are not. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Do you tailor all of those things per, per customer? <laughs> because some of them, it's, eventually it's subjective. The problem you're trying to solve is yes, there are some clear things, but it's mostly subjective. And, you know, you and it's structure wise. And it's so yeah. eventually, when you got the client, and basically you, the easiest thing to do is warn about their opinions since you're not making decisions. The problem. You you will uh, you will lose the confidence of the clients very very quickly if you. But each client will be a little bit different. So yeah, yeah, it's a good question, and we are working on such. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> and 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 for the false positive rate, uh, it's relevant for vision as well. We're taking a lot of images that is out of the domain that we are trying to detect and uh, check what is the rate of the false positive. Of course, we are reviewing them first because in books and in the, the vision data set, we are seeing some relevant examples. So first of all, we are reviewing them. Uh, and as a rule of thumb, above 0.5% of, of, uh, of, of false positive uh, 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 percent, we'll, we'll say that your model is definitely not robust enough and should be. Uh, relabeled and to make it more robust. So once we covered all of our four data sets or test sets, we are ready to, to decide whether our model ready to go to production or not. And uh, at the first cycle, of course, most of the time our model is not robust enough and we should uh, fix uh, and tackle the issues that we defined with our uh, test sets. And uh, at the first one is when we have uh, poor performance across the board. Uh, it means, it may mean two things, that we don't have enough data in our data set that cover your, uh, all of our domain. And, uh, and the second thing is that our uh, label data is not consistent, is not labeled properly. For, for the first one, uh, when we don't have enough data, we are using uh, active learning methods in order to select the next data to label. Because we at the start, we, we collected a huge amount of data, but we didn't label them at first. So we are predicting our current version of model against the data that we didn't label yet. And, um, and we didn't label yet, and we take uh, to label the examples that our model is, more, is most uncertain with. Uh, means that we are taking the example that is around the, our decision boundary of the model, uh, the gray area. And the other thing, in order to make sure that our uh, data is labeled accurately, we are using an open source, open source library called uh, CleanLab that help us to detect such errors in our uh, our data set, it helped us to, to understand that uh, our labelers did not make a good job and we sent them uh, to for relabeling, unfortunately. Clean lab, yeah. Uh, I think they have, they have extended uh, not only for error labeling, but for suggesting an active learning. They grown and uh, I recommend to, to, to try them. Um, the next one is when we have uh, 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 we did not cover some data types. We are getting back to the collection and scraping more relevant data from relevant, uh, like uh, instant messages group or forums, which is longer text or description of websites. Depends on, uh, on, on what data types we are not performing well. And once we had a few, life si a few internal life cycle of collecting more data, relabeling the data, and we have pretty stability in our language model, 
we are uh, going to tackle our weak spot from our fun the functionality tests. And for that, we are using um, uh, data augmentation. Uh, in the data augmentation, we have two ways to, uh, to generate uh, synthetic data or generate da adversarial data to uh, our train set. The first one is the manually generated adversarial examples to fill the gaps. We are using, under, uh, uh, we are using our in, uh, testing environment and we, uh, first of all, we detect in which, which weak spots we are not cover, extract, extracting from those uh, weak spots related terms and go to look for outside in the web for real examples and not a synthetic one. Uh, they are better and, uh, uh, and they are uh, uh, more uh, creative because as a human being, when I'm trying to, to, to generate adversarial examples, I will generate more of the same examples. I'm not that creative, uh, especially when I, I'm not a, a native speaker of English or other languages uh, than Hebrew. Uh, so we prefer to first to, uh, to detect, to, to tackle weak spot by uh, collecting relevant data from the web, real data. Uh, the next one, uh, which uh, uh, works in larger scale is to generate a uh, synthetic data with generative models. Uh, as you can see here with, uh, with the one of two sentences, uh, the model generated uh, 10 long sentences with the term of transgender. Uh, of course, all of those are not considered as hate speech. And when I tried to generate uh, a disrespectful for this term, the generative model said that he's not going to offend anyone. And uh, of course, he has uh, its moderation in it. So I won't deep dive, but uh, uh, there is a very interesting paper by uh, Microsoft Research in 2022 that for the same reason, in order to tackle a weak spot of what called implicit hate speech, which is uh, hate speech that not contains uh, any slurs uh, that they said that most of the hate speech model does not cover. Uh, they generated 270,000 uh, uh, synthetic data with generative model, both uh, the, the, the positive and the negative. Uh, I'm not sure if it will work now because the model has emerged. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Domain adaptation method instead of labeling the data? Domain adaptation for what? For, for, um, um, for like more, like the model. So if you don't have uh, enough labeled data, maybe you can use the domain adaptation method. Yes, we can. We are, done, we are not doing it uh, right now, but it's definitely the start of gen uh, of generated uh, of generating data and i think in the next few months with the emerging of the open source uh, uh generative models we will definitely do that um, okay so we tackled and we covered all of our uh, test set and now we are uh, our model is uh, pretty stable and have good result across the board and we are ready to go to and deploy our model to production and then we will see this example. What do you think? Is this example considered as hate speech? Probably not. Probably not. Why not? It's misspelled. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, of course. So we actually suffered from this issue and we got, uh, we understand that the Indian is not a person, is a meal of a food review. Uh, uh, so it's not following our, fo uh, our policy of hate speech, of course, and we should tackle it. And in order to tackle such uh, false positives, we have our internal uh, moderation platform that we are using in order to get feedback of our production, uh, uh, our production predictions. So you can see here that our hate speech model was 100% sure that this example considered as hate speech. And our uh, subject matter expert gives us a, a, a negative uh, feedback about the prediction. And now we need another cycle for 
generated more data from uh, like these data types, extending our uh, data, uh, data types coverage and retraining the model with more data, more synthetic data. And, we, and the, in the next cycle, we will be robust for such examples as well. So that's all. I hope I convinced you that handling the data is more important than uh, tweaking the endless effort of tweaking architecture and the uh, hyperparameter search. And uh, for, for us, we got the, the, the most benefit from uh, selecting a specific data, label the data accurately, and uh, 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 to get our best results. And I hope you got some tricks or uh, techniques to your uh, purpose. <laughs>